As the European medieval period ended with the passing of the second wave of the Great Mortality, a second renaissance, kindled perhaps from the embers of the first, erupted from Italy, fueled by new trade routes and knowledge from the East. With the fall of Constantinople, the incoming rush of knowledge from scholars of ancient Greek philosophy and science set up and propelled Europe into what is often known as the modern period. As this renaissance evolved and matured, it gave birth to a new revolution, literally in a sense, with the publication of Copernicus's work on astronomy and models of the solar system. This scientific revolution, as it is called, would coincide with other great upheavals in Europe, including the end of feudalism, the Protestant Reformation, and the Age of Discovery. Reaching its culmination in the late 1600s with the publication of Newton's comprehensive summary of a new, universal and mechanical physics, its broad and foundational impact would inspire a generation of thinkers to conceive of a world dictated entirely by universal laws of nature that were accessible to all humanity through experience and the use of reason. This age of enlightenment would rest upon very different assumptions than those that had undergirded the medieval world, and these assumptions would lead to a series of political revolutions that led to the creation of the West's first new democracy in thousands of years, but also gave birth to a political terror that laid waste to the belief that humanity would be able to progress through reason alone. Yet throughout the 19th century, as the consequences of these great shifts in thinking were worked out, the broad assumptions remained the same, at least until the dawn of the 20th century, when the tensions created by the dissonance between democratic models of governance and those of enlightened absolutism began to fracture the political world. Similarly, the classical models of physics, thought for 200 years to be complete, began to display cracks and fissures. And while the political world would end up fighting two wars, in part over the ideas of governance, science would undergo two great revolutions, one on the scale of the very small and the other on the scale of the very large, brought about in large part by a young patent clerk in exile from his homeland. Throughout these periods of change and upheaval, the philosophical contemplation of the nature of time continued with new ideas and understandings being created by each of the great minds from Newton to Kant, until that same young man turned it all on its head. In this episode of the Scientific Odyssey, we'll explore the development of the various frameworks used to describe and understand time, from the absolute realism of Isaac Newton to the unimaginable space-time of Albert Einstein. Hello, and welcome to the Scientific Odyssey. <laughs> Scientific Odyssey is a mini-part journey into the history and philosophy of science. My name is Chad Davies, and I'm the writer, host, and producer of the podcast, where we consider the ideas, processes, and results of over 2,500 years of scientific inquiry and discovery. Series 3, Finding Our Place. Episode 10.4, Supplemental. A Brief History of Telling Time, Philosophy of Time, Part 2. Before we begin, I would like to take a moment to remember my grandmother, Alice Jensen, who passed away recently at the age of 97. My grandmother was a remarkable woman whose very being personified the word grace and who brought into every life she touched a dignity and peace that defied explanation. While there isn't nearly enough time here to detail the rich life she lived during a period of remarkable transformation, both in the United States as a whole, and even more so for the Inner Mountain West where her immigrant family settled and she lived out her years, the stories she told of living in rural Nevada among the rough-hewn ranchers and cowboys there are the stuff of legend. It is from her, more than anyone, that I learned about the inherent dignity of all people. And it was her and my grandfather's love of horizons that allowed me to travel with them to see the vast expanse of the great experiment known as the United States from a very early age. She was a source of unending encouragement throughout my life, both holding me to high standards and reminding me that life was an adventure to be enjoyed. It is to her that I would like to dedicate this episode, 
as she passes beyond time. Memory eternal. In our last episode, we began by asking ourselves if there was such a thing as time, and if there was, what it might be. Our consideration of these questions and the topics associated with them led us to two explicit categories of answers. The first of these is known as idealism. Idealist thinkers, when it comes to understanding time, say that it is a product of the human mind rather than a thing in and of itself. Parmenides, Zeno, and later Augustine said that what we call time does not exist as an explicit part of nature, but instead it is a creation of the human mind. In contrast, the philosopher Aristotle claimed that time was a real thing, but only in the sense that it formed or established a relationship between before and after, a position known as either relationism or relationalism. I've seen both terms used. For Aristotle, time, like number, was a mathematical idea that defined how one event was ordered in relation to another. Implicit in Aristotle's thinking on the topic is the idea that time is a real thing, existing externally to the human mind. But it should be understood that it wasn't a thing like, say, a material object, a chair or a person, for example. What should be understood about each of these philosophers' positions is that their arguments and relational statements about time all relate to how change is to be represented. Another way to think of this is to recognize that the big question folks in the ancient world were trying to answer was, is there change in the natural world? And the questions about time were all wrapped up inside of that larger context. As we jump forward from the 5th century to the period of the scientific revolution and the enlightenment some 10 or 11 centuries later, it is useful to realize that this context had changed very dramatically. By 1600, it was pretty well accepted that change was a fundamental and real part of not only the human experience, but also the actual natural world. Because of this, the topic of the nature of time emerges in its own right as an area of philosophical consideration. This change happens for several reasons, but perhaps the most fundamental is that there are a number of changes taking place in the field of natural philosophy that we generally call physics today. Now we'll actually spend a couple of episodes looking at the specifics of this change, who caused it, how it happened, and why it was so important and the like. But suffice it to say that the period known as the scientific revolution ushered in an entirely new understanding of the nature of the motions of bodies and why they moved in the way they did. Prior to the 1400s, the key ideas of these topics, collectively known again as physics, were those that had been put forward by Aristotle. However, Beginning with the post-plague renaissance, a number of natural philosophers began to reconsider Aristotle's ideas about topics such as force and motions, and found that there were profound problems with Aristotle's description, at least as it related to terrestrial motion. Over time, a number of alternative descriptions were advanced to better explain the motion of objects both on the earth and in the heavens until there were two particularly important figures. The first of these was Galileo who put forward a language of describing motion based on empirical evidence he had collected on falling bodies. The key thing about this language is that it was explicitly mathematical in both nature and expression. The second figure was Isaac Newton, who, working from progress made by Galileo and René Descartes, created an integrated way of understanding both the how and why of moving objects in his work Philosophe Naturalis Principia Mathematica or the mathematical principles of natural philosophy. First published in 1687 and substantially updated in its second edition in 1713, the Principia, as it is known, was a masterwork of both physics and mathematics that fundamentally changed how people understood the natural world around them. Now, lest I leave you with a misconception, let me be clear here that Newton doesn't do this work as some sort of lone genius as is often portrayed. 
As I'll discuss in later episodes, he built off of the ideas of both predecessors and colleagues, often working in tandem with them in ways that helped him better define his ideas. From a physics standpoint, what made the Principia so revolutionary was that it completely overthrew the Aristotelian view of force and motion, replacing it with a far superior description, one that, like Galileo's work, relied on mathematical models that related change in position to a change in time. However, perhaps just as importantly, from a philosophical standpoint at least, is that it was just as revolutionary for another reason. Its description of motion unequivocally rested on the idea that both time and space were real things that the universe had to have if it were to make any kind of sense. In our present discussion of time, this way of understanding time is known as temporal realism. In this picture, time isn't just a relationship between events, but rather a real thing that objects travel through, just like space. If we think of a person walking through a room, what we're thinking of is that the object is contained within the space defined by the walls of the room, and that if it is moving, its coordinates in that space are changing. In other words, the space is a sort of container for things such as chairs, tables, air molecules, and such. Time acts in the same way, except that a change in an object's time location could be thought of as duration. Now before we go much further, let's recognize what a dramatic break from the previous ideas this is. If you look at Aristotle's physics, there's a sort of spatial coordinate idea implicit in his writings, based on his view of a spherically organized and repetitive cosmology. But, as we said in the previous episode, he didn't really think of time in quite that same way. After him, due to the preeminence of the work of Augustine, the idea of time as a real thing had more or less been abandoned. However, Newton, building as he did off the work of earlier natural philosophers, made such a picture absolutely explicit and necessary for his formulation of physics. It was a process that had begun with those earlier natural philosophers up through and including Galileo, who had incorporated time as a real thing in the mathematics of their analysis but it was Newton who brought the idea to full fruition. In addition to saying that there was both space and time as real things, he also argued that these must be absolute, meaning that they were a framework against which everything in nature could be measured with reference to. Another way to say this is that Newton saw there being an absolute reference frame, to use a term from our previous episode, against which all position and duration, and hence all motion, could be measured. Motion measured in this way was called absolute motion by Newton. Moreover, this absolute reference frame was the same for all points in time and space, and thus the laws of physics dependent on it must be universal, meaning that they should be the same in all places. To be clear, these are huge leaps for Newton to make philosophically. First, there is a rejection of Aristotle's ideas of relative motion and relational time. That's a big one. Second, of course, is the imposition of an absolute framework. Third is the assertion that part of this framework was time as a real thing like space. As might be expected, there were a number of people who took exception to these new claims, even as they acknowledged this new formulation of physics's ability to accurately predict behavior with a breadth and accuracy that had never been seen previously. So what evidence is there for and against Newton's position? For natural philosophers of the time, and scientists of the 18th and 19th century, the greatest argument in favor of Newton's picture was that it worked. It satisfied the primary requirement for any scientific idea. It was able to make testable predictions about the behavior of various systems that, when tested, were confirmed. Because of this, the entire framework, including the position of temporal realism, was adopted by much of the scientific community especially that portion associated with the British philosophical movement known as empiricism. However, there were those who disagreed with the claims being made. The most prominent of these people was an Austrian mathematician with whom Newton would have an, a long-running dispute over who invented calculus, Gottfried Leibniz. In addition to having discovered or invented calculus, and in a way that was different to what Newton had done to do so, Leibniz had his own ideas about how physics should work. While his formulation of a set of laws of motion were much less successful than Newton's in describing the natural world, hence the reason you never actually hear about Leibniz's laws of motion, 
They were based on a number of foundational assumptions about things like space and time that were quite different than those used in Newton's formulation. Leibniz was something of an Aristotelian in his view of time due to theological reasons. Because of their long-running feud over calculus, the two men never corresponded directly about the matter. But Caroline, Princess of Wales at the time, was able to set up a public discourse between Leibniz and one of Newton's associates, one Samuel Clark, that would take place through published correspondence. In this discourse, Leibniz offered his objections to Newton. First, he says, like Aristotle, that time can't be real, because if it were, it would have to consist of a series of instants, and given that those instants would have zero duration, they could never make up the long flow of Newton's absolute time. If time wasn't made of instants, Leibniz asks, then what is it made of? His second objection is, if time was an emanation from God, as Newton had claimed, then Leibniz felt that time as a thing would require God to be within it and thus depended on it for his existence. This contradicted the idea that God was self-sufficient. Third, reprising a question from Augustine, if time was independent, then why did God create the universe at one time but not another? Leibniz made a similar argument about space, noting that God could have chosen any arbitrary location in absolute space to create the universe, so why didn't he create one that was five feet to the left of the one we actually experience? In these arguments, we see that Leibniz was a temporal relationist, like Aristotle, who also, like Augustine, felt it necessary to preserve certain theological positions in his objections to Newton. Now Clark, writing under Newton's supervision, responded with a rather ingenious experiment. He asked Leibniz to consider a bucket filled with water. Now, if the bucket is allowed to rotate and does so, at first the water doesn't rotate because of its fluid nature. It won't travel in circles inside the bucket. However, over time, as friction and viscosity do their thing, the water will also begin to rotate. And as it does, the surface of the water will become concave due to its movement up the side of the bucket as, as it obeys Newton's laws of motion. If the bucket is now suddenly stopped, only the water is left rotating and its surface remains concave until, again, friction with the side of the bucket and internal viscosity slow its rotation to a stop. What this shows, according to Clark, is that the water's relative movement compared to the bucket was irrelevant to producing the phenomenon of the surface concavity. Instead, it had to be the water's rotation with respect to some absolute space in absolute time that was important, as the effect couldn't adequately be explained in any other way except by the water's absolute motion. Leibniz, of course, hated this idea of absolute motion because if the entire universe were drifting in some direction at a constant speed, there would be no effective way to distinguish between motion in a universe at rest and one that was moving. Hence, God would have no reason for choosing one state of the universe over the other. Nevertheless, he has no answers to Clark's empirical evidence, and so his objections founder and Clark, and thus Newton, carry the debate and the day. So what does Newton think this absolute time really is? Like everyone else, he's pretty vague, though he does reference it in terms of what it does, i.e. flows or passes. The question then becomes, are we floating in some sort of time river, kind of like leaves floating down a stream? While Newton is promoting his version of temporal realism, there's another figure in England also trying to understand time. John Locke, a devoted follower of British empiricism, is trying to develop a theory of government grounded in the reality of human experience. The culmination of this effort was the publication of his second treatise of civil government, published in 1689. In it, he expands on the idea of the social contract between a government and the governed. In particular, he's attempting to show that since all knowledge and understanding can be derived empirically, there is no special class of individuals who have limited access to special knowledge that would allow them the ungranted right to rule others without their consent. In support of this, he also published a work titled An Essay Concerning Human Understanding during the following year that attempted to explain how human sense experience produced our understanding of things like time and where they come from. Specifically, he wants to talk about certain ideas related to time such as succession and duration.
As a realist, he agreed with Newton's view on the existence of time, but he was careful to point out that since time was a different sort of thing than regular objects, we don't actually directly experience or observe it. Rather, he says, it's by experiencing succession and duration that we can determine the existence of time. He writes, quote, "'Tis evident to anyone who will but observe what passes in his own mind, that there is a train of ideas which constantly succeed each other in his understanding as long as he is awake. Reflection upon these appearances of several ideas, one after another in our minds, is that which furnishes us with the idea of succession. And the distance between any parts of that succession, or between the appearance of any two ideas in our mind, is what we call duration." End quote. So, what Locke is saying is that this everyday sort of stream of consciousness sort of thought that we all experience, combined perhaps with any interrupting sense perceptions, is what allows us to understand the idea of temporal succession, and thus the reality of time. In his argument, it is the very one thing after another sort of nature of that stream of consciousness that would suggest the flow of time to any person with the intervals between the individual thoughts allowing us to experience an understanding duration. At first, this seems like a pretty good idea. We've all had those days where we just hop from one thing to another mentally, and when we reflect back on the train of thought, we sort of understand that one thing came after another, after another, in some sort of relational order, maybe. And so that's how we learn to recognize the flow of time, according to Locke. The problem is, that's not an accurate way to think of the cognitive process by which this really happens. At any given moment, you can only have one thought or idea that you're sort of focused on. Thus, if you reflect on the whole train of ideas, what you have to be doing is reproducing it in your memory as a record of past thoughts. But if that's the case, how do you know what order to put the thoughts in? For example, did you think of Looney Tunes cartoons? and then Porky Pig, and then Bacon, and then Davy's first law of Bacon? Or was it the other way around, or maybe some other order? How do you know? Now, if you're calling up all of these ideas together, then what you're really doing is only actually accessing one complex idea, which really isn't succession. In other words, to know what order you need to put each of the thoughts in the train in, you have to already have an idea of temporal succession before the experience. Therefore, the experience of the stream of consciousness doesn't teach us about time, but rather presupposes that we already know about it. Without some help, Locke's idea that our understanding of time is derived from nothing more than our sense experience is pretty much a non-starter. Oh wait, there's a question in the back? What's Davy's first law of bacon, you ask? Well, that's simple. Everything's better with bacon. Even bacon. Do you doubt the truth of this law? Think of science. Science was good, but got better with the addition of Roger, the ideas of Roger Bacon. It then got even better with the later ideas of Francis Bacon. See? Everything's better with Bacon. Even Bacon. So okay, what's next? While the framework of Newton becomes one of the dominant ideas of the Enlightenment, a movement that it helps sustain and grow, British empiricism isn't the only game in town. On the continent of Europe, there were a number of thinkers who still put forward a rationalist approach to the intellectual work being done. Even as they accepted the predictive power of Newton's paradigm, they pushed back against many of the other conclusions of the empiricists most notably those of David Hume. Now it should be noted that Hume had recently sort of demolished a couple of centuries of philosophical thought on things like mind-body dualism. Interestingly, even though he was an empiricist, among the targets of his penetrating philosophical inquiry were the sciences themselves. One of the questions he asked was how can science arrive at knowledge that can be considered as true as that arrived at by using deductive reasoning 
while only using induction. In other words, since science is an inductive process, how can we be sure that the knowledge it arrives at is as good as the deductive reasoning used in, say, mathematics? Now, we'll delve into this topic of Hume's in a podcast episode down the road of ways. But what's important to note here is that this is part of what might be thought of as Hume's stable cleaning of philosophy. So thorough was this effort that by the end of his life, many areas of philosophical inquiry were left with serious questions regarding their validity. Into this gap would step one of the most brilliant and influential thinkers in the history of humanity, Immanuel Kant. A Prussian philosopher of the 18th century, Kant took up Hume's questions across a number of areas and attempted to reconstruct a rationalist philosophical framework that would be able to stand up to Hume's empiricism. This work would lead him to create entirely new frameworks of philosophical thoughts on a vast number of topics, including time. So what leads him into the topic? Well, the questions Hume had raised about the nature of scientific knowledge led Kant to go back and re-examine what natural philosophers, namely physicists, were using when they were thinking about the natural world. What he realized was that there was a basic set of foundational concepts they used to explain what they saw in the real world. Ideas like material substance and causation, space and time, things like that. While he felt that these were very good concepts to use, he wanted to understand what would allow a natural philosopher or scientist to apply them to their experience of observing and experimenting with the natural world. In other words, what justified the use of these particular concepts and the generalizations and the forms of laws and theories they lead to with regards to the universe? In order to answer these questions, Kant decided to go back to the very beginning to understand how the human mind works to formulate ideas about the world around it. It was only by doing this that he thought Hume's skepticism about the validity of scientific knowledge could be addressed. The result of his thought on this topic is a very dense and complex work known as his Critique of Pure Reason. The central idea of this work was, in the words of Adrian Bardon, quote, his insight that the key to understanding cognition was an understanding of the most fundamental cognitive achievement, the one that makes all coherent experience possible, the interpretation of one's own experience in terms of time." Unquote. And so here we are, back at time again. What Kant realized was that while there were significant problems with Locke's picture of thought succession, it held within it a path to a solution. That solution was to recognize that time was not a real thing, but rather a form of sensible experience, wherein the mind orders the experiences in time based on some internal criterion. So let's take a look at how he does this. First, he distinguishes between what we find in our experience and the nature of our experience itself. As such, he says that there isn't any such thing as space and time in the way Newton says, but instead that these are actually forms of experience. In other words, we experience things spatially and temporally. A way to think of the distinction would be to say that for Newton, space and time are nouns, and so we experience events in space and in time. Kant, on the other hand, says that it would be more linguistically proper to discuss the role of these in an adverbial sense. In this way of looking at things, we now experience events spatially and temporally, those things being already existing frameworks through which we interpret what is happening around us. The only way we can think about our experience is temporally, as a matter of fact, at least according to Kant. In this sense, Kant is reversing Locke's idea. Locke says that we can't understand time until we experience succession. Kant says no. To understand our experience, we must already have an already existing concept that allows us to fix events temporally. So what we've got here is Kant saying that while time doesn't exist as part of reality, it is absolutely a part of how we make sense of our experience. So how does this work? How does the mind impose a temporally coherent order on the sensory input we receive? The key thing for Kant in this regard is the necessity of substance and causation in our mental framework when we experience things. 
All things must be made of substance. This is a requirement of a material universe. Each thing will be related to other things through causal relationships. When one thing interacts with or affects another, the cause can be inferred if not observed. However, to do this in an accurate way, we must already possess a framework to place these causal events in. What Kant says is that in some way, we're born with a pre-existing paradigm or framework wherein to understand substance we think spatially, and to understand causality we think temporally. In other words, if one thing causes another, we say that there is a time order to the thing, and that time order must originate in our minds, even if it doesn't actually exist in reality. It is this time-ordered way of experiencing reality that allows us to understand cause and effects. So, how is it that we can even conceive of a reality without time if all of our experience is processed in a temporal way? Kant thinks that even though we can't imagine what reality without time is like due to this preloaded temporal paradigm that we all have, he says that we can imagine the idea of one. An example of this sort of thing is the idea of infinity. Mathematically, we can talk about infinity all we want, and we have an idea of what infinity is mathematically. But what we can't do is actually think of an infinite quantity of something, say, an infinite number of peaches or apples. The same goes for an atemporal reality. We can think of the abstract idea of one, but if we had tried to imagine our own reality through the lens of our experience, we can't imagine experiencing it without the temporal framework. So where does this framework come from? Well, Kant's a bit vague about this, which is okay, really. Today, a cognitive scientist familiar with evolutionary theory might say that having a physiology that is encoded with some sort of temporally bound sensory network would present a significant evolutionary advantage for an organism. For example, if we really experienced a reality without time, as Kant suggests is truly the case, then all threats would be deemed equally bad, and thus would be significantly less able to determine which ones present the most risk. However, if some threats could be placed in the past and others in the future, then the number of present threats will be reduced significantly, perhaps at times to zero. Moreover, thinking of things temporally would allow for an organism to more easily understand causal relationships, thus allowing for planning. Now, before we leave Kant, there is one other piece of this that we need to spend some time with, as it will become a very important tool for us to understand a lot of what is to come. The thing we want to spend some time thinking about is the difference between experiencing change in a static environment and change in a dynamic environment. The reason this is important to Kant is that it shows that we do have built in, or preloaded if you will, different ways of constructing experience that we have access to depending on the particulars of the situation of experience that we're encountering. So what does change in a static environment look like? Well, let's say it's a pleasant evening here in my neighborhood, and my wife and I decide to take our dog for a walk. We have a route through the area that we usually take that carries us past many of the turn-of-the-century Victorian homes of our small town. Now, these houses have been in place, for many cases, for over a hundred years. Our experiences on along our walk is that we're moving through a static environment that doesn't change, even though we are receiving a steady input of new sensory experience as new homes and houses come into view. Contrast that with a different environment. Let's say that one evening, instead of going for my walk, I decide to sit on my front porch and watch the world go by. Over the course of my experience there, I may see any number of cars and pedestrians pass my 125-year-old Victorian home, but they will do so in an order that I've never experienced before. This would be an example of experience in a dynamic process. In both of the cases that I've described, the things that I see present themselves successively, but Kant notes that I never have a problem with confusing the first case with the second. If I go to Savannah, say, I'll be able to recognize the difference between a changing experience based on the static buildings there and the one based on the dynamic movement of other tourists and vehicles. In Kant's framework, this is because I already have the necessary mental frameworks to understand each of these sets of experiences, each of these successions of events in appropriate ways.
In other words, my ability to differentiate between static and dynamic environments doesn't come from evidence from the succession of experience, but rather from an internal framework of my mental processes. Now, Kant's idealist description of temporal experience is by far the most intricate and developed. It addresses a number of issues found in the realist position very well, and it also addresses where our sense of experience of time actually comes from. It is not, however, without its own issues. First, it doesn't account for the success of Newton's framework. Second, while it puts forward a highly coherent picture, it falls short of offering proof of its accuracy. In other words, sure Kant's picture accounts for the experience of succession and duration, but there's no requirement that it's actually the explanation for those things. And there's no evidence either. Third, and this is somewhat related to the second point, it didn't really explain why this scheme of understanding experience would be better than some other. Why do we have a temporal and spatial framework instead of something else? Or why does our temporal and spatial framework act the way it does instead of in some other way? While one might now make an evolutionary argument, even this is still very speculative, with little evidence to support it beyond its seeming rationality. Finally, it seems a little difficult to accept that there is no time if there isn't someone at some point to experience or observe something. It seems that things should change whether there's an observer around or not. Later on, we'll take a look at some alternatives to Kant's formulation that are compatible with both his picture of things and temporal realism. Before we wrap up this episode, I'd like to look at one more idea from a temporal realist perspective. This idea dates to 1905 and that young German working in the Swiss Patent Office. In the 1860s, James Clerk Maxwell was able to, through a brilliant combination of experiment and theory, show that electrical and magnetic phenomena were actually two aspects of the same physical interaction between particles having the property we call charge. He encapsulated his ideas in what are known as Maxwell's equations, a group of four expressions that succinctly and beautifully accounted for all of the known behavior of charged systems at the time, and it also showed that such systems could produce waves of electromagnetic radiation that moved with a speed that very nearly matched the speed measured for visible light. Light had been understood to move with a finite speed since the observations made by Christian Romer in 1767, and as the next century passed, measurements of the value of the speed of light's travel across space had begun converging towards a value that was fairly close to the speed of Maxwell's equation predicted for the electromagnetic radiation wave. Additionally, as we discussed in our series of the atom, it had been shown that light possessed wave properties by Thomas Young way back in 1801. So the question Maxwell had answered was what type of waves light was. But there was another question that remained. That question was what was the medium through which the waves traveled? When we think of waves on water, we recognize that the wave is energy moving through the medium of the water in such a way as to displace the water up and down at right angles to the direction the wave was traveling. There was also another issue with Maxwell's equations that didn't become apparent until a little later. As good as they were in predicting the behavior of electrical and magnetic systems, they didn't seem to properly obey the rules of Newton's absolute space and time. Now addressing the first question, the, the type of medium through which the waves are traveling, that fell to two American physicists, Albert Michelson and Edward Morley. The two men proposed that light was a wave in a medium that they called the ether which is a term left over from the days of Aristotle's element theory, actually. It was thought that the movement of light through the medium could be confirmed by measuring the change in the speed of light when the Earth was moving in different directions through the medium, something that could be done by making measurements six months apart when, due to the nearly circular orbit of the Earth around the Sun, the direction of the Earth's motion through the hypothesized ether would have changed. <laughs> 
The two physicists set up an experiment using what is now called a Michelson interferometer, the original and much smaller forerunner to the massive piece of equipment we discussed in our episode on the direct detection of gravitational waves. Much to their surprise, the interferometer showed that the speed of light was measured to be identical regardless of the direction of the Earth's travel, something that seemed to violate Newton's absolute space and time. In 1895, the physicist Lorentz was able to arrive at a result that would work properly, but to do this, he had to set aside Newton's assumptions and come up with a new set of what we call coordinate transformations. So let's take a minute to talk about this, as it's going to be vital to understanding everything we do going forward. In Newton's absolute space and time framework, motion observed from within one frame of reference could be compared to observations of that same motion from a different frame of reference usually using what are known as Galilean transforms. To understand this, let's imagine you and I are going to observe a ball being thrown from a car. Let's say that you're in the car and you're traveling at a speed of 20 miles an hour with respect to me while I'm at rest standing in a frame of reference with no speed with respect to the absolute space coordinate system of Newton. Now, if you could throw a ball with a speed of 20 miles per hour in the same direction you're moving, you would observe the ball to have a speed of 20 miles per hour, while I will say it has a speed of 40 miles an hour. Because I'll add the speed of the car you're throwing the ball from to the speed with which you throw the ball. This rule for calculating how each of us will measure the ball's speed is given by adding the two velocities together in a straightforward linear fashion. Actually, it's not quite straightforward because it's actually what we would call a linear vector fashion, but that's a detail for later. This so-called Galilean transformation between frames of reference, in our case, the car for me, and absolute space for you, is what Newton said governed our way of seeing events from different coordinate systems. Unfortunately, this type of transformation didn't work for the speed of light measurements done by Michelson and Morley. Lorenz had developed a new frame of reference rule that would explain the outcome of their experiment, but that was significantly different from the Galilean transform rule. This, of course, led to a question of why this transform worked when the one based on the assumption of an absolute space and time didn't. After about 10 years of head scratching, a young German physicist who had fled his native country for Switzerland came up with an answer one that would fundamentally change the whole way we see the universe. This person, of course, was Albert Einstein, who, gifted with substantial amounts of unallocated time due to the slow pace of work at the patent office, and his own inherent brilliance, of course, was able to spend a lot of time thinking about the nature of reality and then working out the consequences of his assumptions about that nature. In this instance, Einstein was riding his bicycle, when he began to think about what it would be like to travel along with the beams of light that pierced the tree canopy overhead as he rode. As part of this consideration, he wondered what would happen if the speed of light was, in fact, actually consistent with Michelson and Morley's experimental results, i.e., what would happen if the speed of light was really the same in any reference frame, regardless of the motion of that reference frame. In working this out in some detail, he found that he could resol resolve all the difficulties of Maxwell's equations, and he could reproduce the Lorentz transforms naturally from his basic assumptions. The one thing that this required, however, was a complete abandonment of Newton's absolute space and time. Einstein's biggest claim was that all laws of motion are absolutely the same for any observer moving at a constant velocity regardless of what that velocity is, or, more importantly, what that velocity is relative to something else. This includes all of the mechanical laws, as well as the newly discovered relationships governing electro electromagnetism and thus light. This assumption had several important consequences. First, this meant that no reference frame moving at a constant velocity was preferred over another. Additionally, this meant that you couldn't use any physical result to determine between a reference frame that was standing still and one that was, say, moving to the right at a constant velocity. And finally, this means that the idea of an accessible absolute space and hence an absolute motion 
was untenable. A way to think of it is, let's say that you and I are moving with respect to each other at a constant velocity. Now there are a lot of ways this can happen, and it would still look exactly the same. I could be standing still, and you could be moving. You could be standing still, and I could be moving in the other direction. We both could be moving. What Einstein is saying is since the laws of physics have to work exactly the same in each of these cases, we can't determine which is actually taking place. All we can say is that we're moving with respect to each other. Because of this, one can't determine what an absolute motion would be, and so it becomes irrelevant. The next consequence, as you may have already deduced, is that once you get rid of absolute motion and have a speed of light that is the same in all frames of reference, you have to do away with absolute time. Let's see if I can give you an example of why by using a classic thought experiment. Let's say you're on a train moving to the right and I'm standing on a train platform. To my left and right, let's say there are two poles with lights on them that can flash on and off, each 1,000 meters away from my position, but not moving with respect to me. Okay, now let's consider a set of events from my perspective standing on the train platform. Let's say that as you go by, at the instant you pass me, the two lights flash on and off at exactly the same time, at least from my perspective. Now how do I know this? Well, the reason is that the light, traveling at the same speed from both poles, will take the same amount of time to reach me. However, from my perspective, since you're traveling towards one of the lights and away from the other, the flash from the pole in front of you will get to you before the flash from the pole behind you does. For you, the events do not happen simultaneously. Now this is all done from my perspective where I assume I'm at rest with respect to the poles. What if what's really happening is that you're the one that's at rest and it's the train platform moving along with the earth in the opposite direction that's actually moving. In other words, I'm the one that's moving. Remember, according to Einstein's assumptions, we can't actually tell which is which. Then what happens? Well, then we would say that the poles are at rest with respect to you and that the two flashes didn't happen at the same time. I only saw them that way because I was moving. What this means is that we can't establish an absolute time because both conclusions are valid from the perspective of each reference frame. This is what Einstein called the special theory of relativity and it completely destroys Newton's framework. Moreover, the various consequences of this theory and the more powerful general theory of relativity, the 100th anniversary of which we celebrate this year, have been tested and shown to be unerringly accurate. The entire framework can be said to be the most successfully tested scientific idea in the history of humanity. Another common thought experiment that is often discussed to illustrate this point is known as the light clock. As I don't want this episode to grow to an unwieldy length, at least beyond what it already is, I'll leave this as an exercise for the curious listener to see how a clock in a frame of reference moving with respect to another will seem to tick more slowly than a clock in the other frame of reference, leading to something we call time dilation. Of course, to the observer in the other frame of reference, it's our clock that will seem to run too slowly, again, shattering the notion of an absolute time. So along with the loss of the idea of absolute time is the loss of an idea of absolute space and absolute motion, as we said earlier. Newton's space and time are now replaced with something Einstein calls space-time, a four-dimensional quantity. And while space and time can no longer be used to locate events, one can locate them in this new space-time. And what Einstein is able to show is that the interval between two events in space-time that can sort of be thought of as a combination of the separation of events in location and duration is invariant between reference frames. Even though different reference frames will divide up the interval between space and time differences differently due to their relative motion with respect to each other, this quantity representing the separation between two events in space-time, that interval, will remain the same. Now this is really weird, I understand that. The first problem we have is that we can't think physically or visualize things in four dimensions. Our sensory experience is limited to three dimensions spatially and then a separate experience of duration and succession, 
and so our ability to visualize beyond this is lacking. To get a sense of this, see if you can do the following. First, with one of your hands, point your index finger as you naturally would. Now hold your thumb straight up. Notice that if we abstract a little bit, these two digits will form a right angle to each other. You can think of your index finger as representing width and your thumb as denoting height. Now take your middle finger and point it so that it looks like it's coming out of the palm of your hand. Again, if abstracted a bit, this finger, representing depth if you'd like, is at right angles to your index finger and to your thumb. This is a three-dimensional coordinate system. Sometimes I call it the physics gang sign, so, you know, whatever. Now, here's the part that may melt your brain a bit. Try to imagine another axis, or another way to point a finger, that would be at right angles to all three of the other fingers. This would represent a fourth dimension that you could perceive. Notice, you can't actually do it. Anything you try to imagine is actually just pointing in one or more of the other axes directions that you've already defined. In other words, you can't think of the fourth dimension because you can't experience four dimensions. If you recall from last time, when we talked about the possibility, we said that the way we experience reality doesn't actually have to correspond to the way reality actually is. And this is a case of that. Einstein says that the reality we live in is four-dimensional space-time, but all we seem to be able to experience is some sort of three-dimensional space and something that we call time that isn't very well defined for us. So, as was the case in Kant, we are limited to talking about something we can't actually imagine, but can express in some sort of idealized state, usually using mathematics. In Einstein's reformulation, it's space-time that's now the thing that doesn't change for different observers. In other words, if you and I are in different frames of motion moving relative to each other the constant velocity, we'll disagree on when events occur temporally and where they occur spatially, but what we'll both be able to measure, and that measurement will be the same for both of us, is what's called the space-time interval between them. This value in Einstein's formulation of relativity is shown to be a constant for any two events as measured from any reference frame. Now, the question that needs to be asked is, what is space-time actually, and is it real? Remember, what Einstein has produced is a mathematical model that accounts for the various observations of reality that have been made previously and that predicts new outcomes for novel experiments to test the nature of the physical world. For Hermann Minkowski, a mathematician responsible for continuing to develop the mathematical expression of Einstein's work, he says, quote, The views of space and time that I wish to lay before you have sprung from the soil of experimental physics and therein lies their strength. They are radical. Henceforth, space by itself and time by itself are doomed to fade away into mere shadows, and only a kind of union of the two will preserve an independent reality. In other words, it is now space-time that acts as a container for all events, a fabric of reality wherein all events occur and can be related to each other either causally or observationally. In 1916, Einstein will broaden the idea of space-time and the nature of relative motion with the publication of his general theory of relativity. Where the special theory only treats objects in frames of reference that are moving with constant velocity and thus have straight-line trajectories through space-time, the general theory allows for objects in frame of reference that accelerate and for the space-time to be warped by the presence of mass. We'll spend a good bit of time discussing the broad implications of this in a later episode in the series. For the time being, therefore, let's sort of restrict ourselves just to the consideration of time. To answer the question of what space-time is, that's something that's really hard to do. If you try to describe it as a sort of block of infinitesimally small points, you run into many of the problems and paradoxes we've already discussed from Zeno to Leibniz. Usually, though, if you're a physicist, you don't really care about that, as your calculations about the behavior of the systems doesn't really depend on whether space-time really exists or not. Therefore, your position turns into something of a philosophical one. If you're a scientific realist, you think that the theories created 
are a real description, at least in some level, of what's really going on in the universe. And therefore, you think space-time's a real thing. It's this real fabric. If, on the other hand, you subscribe to scientific instrumentalism, you say that our theories are merely intellectual instruments that allow us to account for our observations, but they don't necessarily have any requirement to correspond to reality in any way beyond being able to describe the experience that we get from that. Physicist N. David Merman, writing from the instrumentalist perspective, puts it this way when discussing whether space-time is real. Quote, the raw material of our experience consists of events. Events, by virtue of being directly accessible to our experience, have an unavoidably classical nature. Space and time and space-time are not properties of the world we live in, but concepts we have invented to help us organize classical events. Notions like dimension or interval or curvature or geodesics are properties not of the world we live in, but of the abstract geometric constructions we have invented to help us organize events. In his book, A Brief History of Time, Stephen Hawking writes, quote, A theory is just a model of the universe, or a restricted part of it, and a set of rules that relate quantities in the model to observations that we make. It exists only in our minds and does not have any other reality, whatever that might mean. A theory is a good theory if it satisfies two requirements. It must accurately describe a large class of observations on the basis of a model that contains only a few arbitrary elements. And it must make definite predictions about the results of future observations." End quote. Finally, physicist Sean Carroll writes, quote, Perhaps surprisingly, physicists are not overly concerned with educating which concepts are real or not. They care very much about how the real world works, but to them it's a matter of constructing theoretical models and comparing them with empirical data. It's not the individual concepts characteristic of each model, i.e. past, future, time, that matter. It's the structure as a whole. Indeed, it often turns out to be the case that one specific model can be described in two completely different ways using an entirely different set of concepts." End quote. In other words, may not matter whether we know what space-time actually is as long as we can use it to accurately predict what is going on in terms of our experience. Before we wrap up this topic though, I should say one other thing. When we talk of an instrumentalist perspective on scientific theories, we aren't really talking about the postmodernist claim that scientists can construct a theory out of any old thing, particularly one that reinforces their biases and worldviews. While there are many instances of this being done in the history of science, there is one thing that constrains the process of hypothesis formation, the existence of some sort of external reality. It should be stressed that even those with an instrumentalist take on relativity theory, or for that matter quantum mechanics and whatever follows it, believe that there must be an external reality that must be described. Thus. Theories have to conform to the experiences derived from that reality to have any validity. To be sure, a philosopher who is tired of the oppression of gravity is welcome to develop a theory that rejects its existence. But if that theory does not account for the fact that if he or she steps off a roof, they'll accelerate towards the surface of the earth, it will be rejected no matter how elegant or in tune with ideological suppositions it might be. It'll also hurt a lot when they hit the ground. At this point, we need to bring this episode to a close. While we aren't done talking about relativity yet, we're already running a bit long and it'd be nice to be able to use it as a springboard for us to talk about the thinking of contemporary philosophers and scientists related to time and its passage. As always, thanks for joining us on this exploration of time, and I hope you don't find it too esoteric. I think it's pretty amazing to take a deep look at something we take so much for granted. Also, it's a way for us to learn how to ask better questions and then seek the answers to those questions, the very definition of inquiry. If you have a little bit of time, please consider leaving us a strong review on whatever service you use to listen to the show. 
Also, for those scallywags joining us from the History of Pirates podcast, welcome aboard. Feel free to look around and listen to some of our other episodes, but please, don't drink all the rum. We've got a long ways to go yet. Finally, thanks to the Blue Dot Sessions for the use of their excellent compositions as part of the show. If you'd like to hear more of their work, they can be found at www.sessions.blue. So until next time, full sails on your journey.